Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Uh, we're continuing our look at chemistry again today. Uh, here's a chemical reaction type, um, an exothermic reaction. We're looking at exothermic and endothermic today. Uh, this particular one is looking at aniline and nitric acid. And of course we see smoke formation, we see some color change and ignition. You see a massive burst of energy, um, especially if you add it really fast. And that is what we're talking about today with thermochemistry. We're looking at exothermic and endothermic reactions. Uh, thermochemistry is the study of heat that's either being released or uh, being required by chemical reactions. Uh, so here we have a chemical reaction, uh, the burning of methane um, to get out energy. And um, if we look at the chemical equation, you could actually put energy on one side of it. Uh, this particular one is exothermic because it's producing energy. Energy is on the product side. Uh, an endothermic reaction would require it on the reactant side, so it requires energy to work. Okay. Most reactions are exothermic or endothermic. That's just not very strongly exothermic or endothermic. There's often a change in energy though. Uh, it's very rare that bonds are all the same energies. So when we're talking about energy, there's there's really two types okay, that we, we really focus on, especially in, in the level we're at, and that's potential and kinetic. Okay? Potential energy is stored energy. Okay? You can store that energy in a lot of things, just store it in batteries. You can store it in gasoline inside the chemical bonds, and that's really where we're getting a lot of our energy, is chemical energy for right now. Uh, later on, we'll be talking about other types of potential energy, uh, especially when we're looking at like roller coasters and stuff like that. And of course, we have kinetic energy. We've been talking about kinetic energy a lot for a little while now, and that's the energy of motion. Okay. So the energy of motion, of course, uh, when we're looking at it, is how fast are the molecules moving, uh, things like that. Okay. So when we're talking about energy like this, it's really important to remember uh, the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, so the first law of thermodynamics tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The total energy of a system, the kinetic plus the potential, is always going to be conserved okay so the energy i start with is the energy i end with much like matter was conserved right so matter was conserved i didn't create or destroy atoms i don't create or destroy energy either okay i can change its form though so i can take the chemical energy stored in gasoline and change that energy to use it to power my car okay i can take the energy stored inside a battery and use it to power my cell phone or whatever okay that change of energy doesn't destroy energy it just uses it in different ways so I take it from where it's at and I turn it into something else this is the first law of thermodynamics okay energy cannot be created or destroyed when we're talking about these sorts of things, it's really important to understand this idea of a system and its surroundings. Okay, so a system is what we're we're going to be looking at. Okay, so in this particular picture, um, we have a system uh, that would be the water molecules and the water and the ice inside this cup. Okay, and the surroundings to my system would be the cup, the air, everything around the system, okay? So that's hopefully not too hard to understand. The system is, is what I'm studying, what I'm looking at, and the surroundings is everything else, okay? Now systems come in a few types of varieties, and it really depends upon how easily the system can interact with the surroundings, okay? So an open system, just exchanges its mass and energy with the surroundings, okay? Um, that is not necessarily a good way to look at changes in heat, because if I'm open to my surroundings, then the heat just goes right out, okay? In a closed system, 
um, there is a transfer of energy still, okay? Um, think of it as like a, a cup with a lid. Um, and that cup with a lid is, is probably going to eventually warm up. You know, if you go get a, a soda from um, Carl's Jr. or whatever, uh, and you let it sit there, eventually it warms up, but it doesn't necessarily go as fast as, say, a glass of water uh, that I go and grab. I, I toss some ice and some water, and I let it sit on the counter. That's a more open system, and the other one is a little more of a closed system. Whereas an isolated system, which is really hard to do, is doesn't allow the transfer of either mass or energy. It's isolated and nothing can get out. And that would be very ideal. In fact, most of the errors that occur uh, when doing like thermochemistry stuff, like we're gonna be doing with the hot and cold packs, uh, largely comes from the fact that your system's not completely isolated. Your system's gonna be giving off energy. And the more open your system is, the faster it's going to give off energy. This is really important to understand because a big part of making a successful hot and cold pack is to keep your system isolated so it can maintain the right temperature. Exothermic processes like the ignition that we saw earlier are chemical reactions that give off heat. Um, so even like the burning of a match is giving off heat. Pretty much anything that creates fire is definitely going to be exothermic. Um, fire is a, a very um, obvious sign of massive amounts of heat being given off as light um, is even showing off of it from the heat. Okay, uh, An exothermic reaction is often drawn like this. So if we looked at the energy state of the reactants, okay, and we looked at its potential energy, notice on the, uh, the y-axis here I, I have potential energy. The energy state of the reactants is at a higher state than the products, okay? Now, what happens is that there's some sort of starting input. Uh, we call this the energy of activation, or E, with the little ACT underneath in the picture. The energy of activation is what starts the reaction. Okay? Like you can have all of the ingredients for a fire just sitting there, but until there's a spark to start it, the fire won't start. Okay? Um, so you have to give some input of energy to begin the reaction, whether it's stirring and adding some kinetic energy to things or hitting it with a, a little bit of a, a fire or a match or something like that, a spark. You're, you're going to need some input of energy. Once you do, and the reaction occurs, then it gives off all this potential energy into, as a product, into the surroundings usually, okay? Um, and the product that I make, that the resulting chemicals have less potential energy stored in them, all right? So an exothermic reaction gives off potential, takes the potential energy of the products, of the reactants, and gives it off into the environment, into the surroundings. An endothermic process, on the other hand, is going to take energy in. So energy is actually a reactant that's going to get stored in chemical bonds. Uh, one of the most obvious examples of this is really photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is taking light energy in, and it's storing it in chemical bonds inside the glucose, okay? So as I'm taking the, the radiating energy of the sun in, I store that energy for later use. And in an endothermic reaction, if we looked at the same sort of graph, the potential energy of the reactants is actually a lot lower than the potential energy of the products, okay? I'm storing that energy. So I'm taking the energy from the sun and I'm storing it into the glucose molecules. So that the potential energy of my products is actually a lot lower, or a lot higher, than the potential energy of my reactants was. This sort of process is really useful. Uh, our bodies use it all the time. Um, so one of the energy currencies inside our body is called ATP, 
um, adenosine triphosphate. Um, what it does is it, it's literally making our, our body makes these phosphate bonds. Okay, they're, they're super high energy phosphate bonds, and it stores that energy in ATP. And ATP can then go down to ADP. So instead of having three phosphates, it only has two phosphates, and it just keeps breaking phosphate bonds and reforming phosphate bonds. So when I'm taking energy in and I'm storing it, I'm going to make ATP. When I want to use that energy, I'm going to cash in my ATP and break down into ADP, the diphosphate, okay? The diphosphate ends up having less energy, but I have that energy that I can then do work with. I can move my muscles, I can, my heart can beat, all these different things can occur. And this process is going on inside our bodies all the time, okay? Other ways that I could use exothermic and endothermic reactions that happen to be hot and cold packs, uh, which is what we're going to be engineering here next week. So in a hot and cold pack, I've usually got some sort of uh, chemical reaction that is going to occur when I crush the pack. Uh, so I break some sort of membrane between two chemicals. Those chemicals mix, and as a result, it's either going to give off heat or take in heat from the surroundings. For our study of uh, hot and cold packs, we're going to be using salts. Okay, So with a salt, uh, and you stick that salt into water, what happens is you have this very organized crystal lattice structure, okay? Those bonds have energy. And as I introduce them into water, the water is going to break them apart. If you recall, water is a covalent bond, and those covalent bonds are what's called polar. So there's partial charges. That's that weird squiggle thing. It's a lowercase delta, um, the Greek letter. So I have partial positives on my hydrogen atoms. I have partial negatives on my oxygen atoms. And they're going to come in to the salt crystal, and they're going to arrange themselves so that the partial positives surround the chloride ions and pull them off of the crystal lattice. And the partial negatives of the oxygen are going to surround the sodium atoms and their positive charge and pull them off that crystal lattice. And as a result, I'm going to release the energy of the crystal lattice. Okay? And depending upon whether or not uh, moving everything around and, and breaking it apart costs more energy than the, the crystal breaking apart gives off, that will determine whether it's exothermic or endothermic, okay? Because there's this release of energy, but there's also a lot of motion going on to break it apart. So depending upon what happens there, will decide whether this thing is exothermic or endothermic. And we actually will sort that out through something called calorimetry, which we'll be going over in another video and in our lab. So when we're talking about thermochemistry, it's often important to look at what's called the heat capacity. Heat capacity is a system, okay? So if I'm looking at a system, like in this case, it, let's say I was cooking and my system was a, a kebab or something like that, right? It would be how much heat does it take to raise the temperature of that system, that shish kebab, that um, whatever, right? Dumplings, all kinds of things are being cooked here. Uh, so how much heat does it take to raise that system by one degree? Usually it's Celsius or Kelvin, okay? Um, so that's for a system, but oftentimes we want to talk about it in terms of a smaller amount of stuff. So a specific heat is how much heat is required, how much energy do I need to add to raise the temperature of a gram of a substance by one degree Celsius, okay? So instead of just looking at a whole system, I'm looking at a specific number, I'm looking at one gram, okay? And if I were to say look at lead, Lead requires 0.128 joules for every gram to go up by a degree Celsius. It's a very complicated unit, joules per gram degree Celsius, okay? Uh, 
Uh, but this is actually extremely useful, and this is what we're going to be using to figure out how much salt I should add to a hot or cold pack. Okay. Um, that is often used in a equation called quantity of heat. Okay. Q equals MC delta T is the equation. Q is the amount of heat, the quantity of heat that is present. And Q is going to be equal to the mass of the substance this times the specific heat times the change in temperature I want. So Q equals MC delta T. All right, so let's do an example here. Um, a student must use 225 grams of hot water in a lab procedure. Calculate the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of 225 grams of water from 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. The specific heat for water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay. Start with your equation. Q equals mc delta t. Q equals mc delta t. You're going to plug in m is 225. The c is the heat capacity. That's 4.184. You're always going to be given c. Okay unless you're trying to solve for the heat capacity, then you're gonna be given everything else for it, all right? And the change in temperature is, we're going from 100 or 20 degrees to 100 degrees. You always subtract, uh, you always go final minus initial. So 100 is where I wanna end up with, 20 is where I started at, so 100 minus 20 is 80. And you're just gonna plug that into your calculator, 225 times 4.184 times 80, and you're gonna get 755,312 joules from that. Um, that's really about it. There's a lot of vocabulary that came up, and there's some new equations. You're actually gonna be seeing more about this in another video where we're gonna go a little more in depth into these uh, sorts of equations. Uh, the Q equals MC delta T stuff, and how it applies to our hot and cold pack engineering assignment that we're going to be tackling next week. Uh, so make sure you take a look at the Quizlet decks. Make sure that you stay up with all this vocabulary, and I'll see you in the lab tomorrow.